appreciate you taking the time um, to uh, kind of learn more about the program here. This is the first time I've talked to a room where I can't see anybody, so bear with me if, uh, if I put you asleep. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was in the Marine Corps in 97 to 02. I was on the air wing side. I was a rigger, so I packed chutes. And so I, I did that. Um, I got out of the military, didn't have a lot of career options. And so I became a contractor and during school came through the VSAP program, which is what it was called back then. And then I never left. So I've been working for Colin and Karen now for close to 11 years. Um, I worked on the, on the farm side in the greenhouse for about a year and a half and then started helping uh, Colin uh, teach the program and then eventually I took that over so currently the way we kind of have it set up is I run the school side and then Colin runs the farm side um, what you guys see behind me is a greenhouse I'm in a greenhouse right now and we'll go over we're going to try and do a short tour of the greenhouse so we'll see how that works out um, so you guys can learn more of what what's behind me here uh, but the way I'll I'll set this next hour up is um, I'll go over a little bit about the farm about the program itself through PowerPoint and then uh, we'll try to switch to a short farm tour, probably about 15 minutes at the max. And then we'll end with some Q&A. And so that's kind of the format that we'll go here. If you have questions, uh, save those for the end, please. And then uh, Diego's going to manage the chat um, while I'm presenting here. So um, let me know if my audio goes out or, or the video goes out, because I'd hate to keep talking with no one there. So, um, so please let me know about that. So we'll start with the, with the farm side. And so Archie's Acres was started, I believe, in 2006 or 2007, to be exactly. Colin and Karen uh, bought the property not intending to farm. They brought it that they bought the property because they liked the location. It was two and a half acres, had a house um, and about 220 avocado trees. And this is in San Diego um, in the county here. So we're about 45 minutes outside of San Diego proper. Um, so we're in an area that there's a lot of farms here. And so they bought the property not intending to farm, but they realized the avocados that they had on the farm, the 220 trees were mainly Haas av avocados. They realized that they could sell those and, and make some money off of it. And so they started watering the trees, giving them what they need and uh, started to sell the av avocados at the farmer's market. Um, but one of the things they realized when they were watering the avocado or orchard uh, their water bill was as astronomical in the sense that they um, their first bill was, I think, around nine hundred and eighty dollars. And Con and Karen thought that was for the whole year, but that was actually only for one month. And so they realized at that moment that conventional farming, at least in the southwest where water is kind of scarce, uh, that it's not going to work. So they have to uh, pivot to a different type of model. And so that's when Colin started looking into hydroponics. And, and they decided that uh, they want to keep farming, but they want to do it um, in a sustainable way. And so it's something, hold that one second. I got a frog. I got a kick. Hold that. I'm in the greenhouse and we have frogs in here. So either way, point being is that they, um, they knew they had to find a different way to farm. And so it's something that they looked into hydroponics and then also a way to um, just not exploit a lot of resources. And so they decided that the hydroponic was the route that they were going to go. And so they knew off of a, a very small footprint, which their parcel or their farm was two and a half acres. They knew they could probably make a good revenue stream without spending a thousand dollars a month on a water bill. And so I'll go into specifics on the farming style itself. And so hydroponic is the method that we use 95% of the produce grown on the farm here. Um, and what that basically means is there's no crops that are grown in soil. So everything is grown in some type of container or, or channel. Um, and what that does has two advantages. The first one is we save around 93% of the water compared to soil farming. And not saying the soil farming isn't good. It works. It's a great uh, way to farm if the resources aren't going to have you operate at a loss. Um, so we capture a lot of the water. The only water we use is what the plant takes up. And then also being in, um, in a greenhouse, we just get a lot more turnover. And so, example, if we do basil in the soil, we get about seven turns a year. If we do basil in a hydroponic system in a greenhouse, we get about 17. So from a business standpoint, it really went well with the Southwest and the cost of water. 
And so Colin and Karen decided they wanted to take that route with their growing. And so what you guys are seeing in the pictures here is on the left there, that's basil uh, grown in, uh, basically it's like a gutter, it's called an NFT channel. That NFT channel, we have basically a very um, low PSI water flow from one end with about a one to 2% grade down to another end. And then we capture that water and pump it back up. So it's just a big closed loop. And then the way we sell that, that the basil on the left is we'll pull that whole plant out. It'll go into a plastic sleeve. We put it in a box of 24 and then we drop it off at, at, the, at the stores in the area. On the right is, is a lettuce. We did that initially, but the buyer wanted more, more of the basil. And then we've also, the farm itself has kind of uh, evolved, uh, which most farmers have to do, evolved in doing Persian cucumbers. And then also we're doing heirloom variety tomatoes too. Um, one of the advantages um, that you would learn in the program itself is being in a greenhouse, we don't really have a season that we can't grow, especially being in the Southwest. It is, uh, the products do grow slower in the winter when the days are shorter, but there's no season that we actually have to stop. And so when the greenhouses are getting too cold, they can be heated up. And then when they're getting too hot, we have a way to cool them down. And so it's something that it allows us to grow uh, 12 months a year, which a lot of the buyers appreciate because they're getting product locally that's not having to be shipped in. And so, and then with the nutrients for the products, um, all that's put into what we call the reservoir tank, which is where it's pumped out from. And then we capture that water. So we put all the nutrients in there. Uh, there is some pest control, but with uh, without when we're growing in hydro and no soil involved, we eliminate about 70% of the pest. And so um, we're allowed to grow 12 months a year, and then we eliminate a lot of the pests being above ground. So it does have it is it, it does have advantages, um, and those advantages are helpful because obviously to buy greenhouse structures they get very very expensive. Um, they can range from as cheap as five thousand dollars to up to five million. And so it's something that um, based on your, your um, access to, to capital will dictate how advanced you would get. And so if you've seen the videos on the farm itself, uh, we basically have three tiers. We have the small greenhouse, uh, which I'll go back a slide. It's the one closest to you, which is a 35 by 48. The large one, which is behind it is a 35 by 110. And then um, we have a newer one we just built that is about 38,000 square feet, which is about an acre. Um, price ranges uh, from the smallest, I think that was about 45K when it was uh, purchased in, I think, 2010. And then the largest one, which is a 38,000 square feet, that one runs about a million dollars. Um, and so it's one of those things you definitely want to be able to offset that debt you'd probably take on for that. So, so that's about the farm itself. Um, as another side note, we do deliver to probably about 12 different grocery stores and then a few mom and pop shops. That, those are our, our main buyers. Um, there is some small wholesale, uh, but one of the things with wholesale is that you lose a lot of your revenue when you go wholesale versus direct to consumer or to the grocery stores. And so we try to, um, we do sell at some farmers markets, but that's something that we only do it one day a week. Because for us, it's not really a revenue generator, but it is a marketing tool. And so we do it just to kind of keep our face out there. And so, and so that'll lead me into the, uh, the program itself. Um, when Colin and Karen started this farm, they didn't have a plan of starting an education side to it, but they realized that with the initial two greenhouses, they could pay a salary and still net around $40,000. And so they realized that they could, you could start a farm on a very small footprint. The original size is two and a half acres. And so they wanted to teach other veterans and other civilians how to farm in that, in that method. And so Colin Karen initially started the program with, uh, with the VA, which I think was in 2008. It was under the VSAT program. You might have seen material that's under VSAT and some material that's under SAT. It's the same course. We just had to drop the veteran portion of the name because um, once we got accredited to, uh, for our students to use VA benefits, you technically can't have veteran in the title itself. And so Colin and Karen realized that um, this was a way to get into farming, even if you had no background and not a huge pot of money to, to start off with. And so they wanted to teach other veterans and, and, and civilians on how to do this. And another point is they wanted to help 
with the veteran unemployment rate because it was so high after veterans get out of their first tour. And so they want to help out with, with the employment side too. And so we started in 2008, originally working with the VA. Our class sizes were probably you know, between four, four and six students. Um, and then the, I, the initial model was around six to eight weeks long. And we tend to keep it short because most of our students, which are veterans and civilians, but mainly with the veteran side and active duty, is that um, our, our capacity to learn really fast is there. So we don't need to go to school for two years to learn what we can you know, figure out in two months. And so we kept it very, uh, very co compact. And so it's something that that was the initial kind of uh, spark that lit the fire for the school. And so the school itself is going on about 15 years now. And the pictures you guys can see on the left there, that's the second greenhouse. That's the 35 by 110. And then I'll, I'll go over real quick what you see from the outside in case the farm tour doesn't work. Uh, it's a two ply uh, poly on top. So it kind of blows up like a down jacket and polycarbonate on the front. And then the walls on the side will, will roll up automatically when it gets too hot or yeah, too, too hot or roll down when it's too, too cold. And then what you guys are seeing on the right hand side, that is the pad being graded for the third greenhouse. Uh, that the one, that's the one that's close to an acre around 38,000 square feet. Um, that was originally a field that we would grow in. And then it's something that we decided to use that for greenhouse space. Give me one second. And so the one on the uh, on the left hand side too, at least in San Diego County, they um, they want that structure because they consider it a steel structure to have a wind load and a snow load. I don't understand the snow load part, but it's something that it's built um, to code at least in San Diego. If you're in a different county or state, you're probably not going to have as many rules to follow when it comes to building a structure. But for us, anytime there's a structure that has walls, it has to be safe for people to be in. And so yeah, and then the right hand one was the graded pad. And then uh, one last side note too, the, um, the one on the left, the pad is, is graded at zero and then the channels are pointed at one to two degrees to get the water to flow back to the actual tank. On the right-hand side, that new, um, new greenhouse, we decided to make the whole pad one to two degrees and keep the channels parallel to the floor so everything would flow downhill, which would be to your left if you're looking at that, at the, at that screen. Either way. Just a side note there. So that's the, that's how the program initially got started. Um, and then the kind of more into the fine print of the program, the uh, we were initially um, under the VSAP program and then we started the Archie's Institute, which is the farm side, Archie's Acre, or excuse me, is the education side. Archie's Acres is, is the farm side. And so we partnered with the VA initially and then we worked with the university out here in California, which allowed us uh, to, allow students who had GI Bill, uh, GI Bill benefits to use those for, for the class. And then we currently are with the University of Minnesota. And that's mainly because the Dean at, at the university out here in California loved the program, but she moved to Minnesota uh, to run the university there and wanted to bring the program with her, which is why we're there now. Uh, we run almost everything online now uh, to kind of give access to students everywhere. And that was also a product of the pandemic because we obviously couldn't um, have people on the farm for at least about a year and a half. And so we had to be pushed into being online. And so we, what we've kind of created now is more of a, a hybrid model in a sense that if you're local and you can get to the farm, there's definitely farm work available, farm days, student labs that can be taken over. And so we kind of blend the two together of being online and being on the farm. If you're not uh, local, um, we have had students fly out here for the weekend to get some experience, but it's something that that's an optional piece. And so, and then one of the things that happened too with, with, with the university is that we're able to um, accept VA benefits from the students who want to come through. And they're also able to issue credits for their time. And so within the six week uh, model, you can earn 16 semester credits during those six weeks. So you're basically doing a three to two unit course every seven days. And so we like to say it's trying to drink out of a fire hose, but at the same time, uh, we most of our students graduate as long as they show up and put effort in. And so it's something that um, it's a lot of academic work at one time, but it's something that it, it shouldn't be a problem for, for most of our students. Uh, what you guys are seeing on the left there, that's a student group putting up a shade house. Um, this is an inexpensive way to start any type of growth structure that, that galvanized pipe. 
uh, was bent on site that you can buy in bulk. And what they're putting on top of it is, is shade cloth. And then on the right there, that's one of the farm tours uh, for, for a group of students. And then also that greenhouse in the background is the larger greenhouse, which is actually four bays. And so that one, we could probably actually do around 40,000 basil plants at the same time. And so it's something that it's a pretty massive group greenhouse. And then um, let me keep going here. And then we'll get, uh, and then kind of how it's run, how you would experience it is we run the program through Canvas, which is a next evolution of Blackboard. And so all the assignments are pulled from Canvas and submitted there. You're issued uh, six actual grades for the six weeks. And then we actually do have a night class that, that runs 12 weeks. And so most of the students are in the night class have jobs during the day. And then most of the students um, in the day class are either coming through, um, if they're active duty, they're coming through on Skillbridge, uh, which is a DOD program that allows you to get PTAD orders to leave work to come to the program, or they, those students have time during the day to come through the class. We actually only require students to show up for the lectures, which are on Mondays and Thursdays. And they run from 0 09 to about 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And um, a lot of times we end earlier than that, but that's the only required time we want the students there because we want to have face to face time with the students. We don't want to run this course, have everything pre recorded, and you never get to talk to the instructor because that's something that we don't feel it's an effective way for you guys to learn. And so we meet twice every week. And then if it's a night class, we meet every Tuesday night. And so it's something that it's kind of, I think, um, Synchronous is what they call it in the sense that you'll be with the instructors. I'm usually the main instructor for both the cohorts, and we definitely bring in speakers um, that will help teach the course itself because I'm definitely not the expert. So we'll bring in students who have come through who own uh, uh, restaurants now. We'll bring in speakers for the USDA. Uh, we'll, we'll bring in speakers to talk about in insurance, patents, uh, how not to steal a logo, uh, how to fund your enterprise, and so on. And we usually have speakers every week at least one and then you have a few classes with colin who currently owns own, owns the farm about farm financials and then we also bring in former buyers um, from whole foods market which is a big organic grocery chain which you guys might have heard of and so we definitely kind of want to bring it in the mix there's currently with the instructors there's five that are on staff and all of our instructors are faculty at the, at the university and so um they're, they're they, they've been there and done that so we don't like to bring in people in front of you to share their experiences when they're not really real. And so that's, that's definitely something that we wanna make sure you guys get real real experience there. Uh, what you guys are seeing on the left there, that's uh, students taking their final exam. Obviously that's that's online now. And so um, that, was, that was the original barn that was on the farm itself. And that's where Colin and Karen first started growing crops to kind of test it out to see how it worked. And then on the right, the New York Times did an article on the farm and uh, that's just a photo from, from that article there. So let me keep going here. And then a few of the topics that are covered, we get a lot of cool questions about this. Obviously hydroponics, you know, we, um, we're we probably one of the few hydro organic farms. The farm itself is certified organic through the USDA. And I think they're, Colin Karen were the first hydro organic farm uh, in the state of, of California, at least. And so we've been growing that way for a long time. The organic growing for us, and mainly for Karen and Colin is kind of a lifestyle choice, but also it's a market choice because the prices you get per unit as an organic grower are at least double compared to a conventional farm. A prime example is be uh, bell peppers. If you grew them in a conventional way, the grower out here in San Diego County will get about $1.25 a pound. If they're growing organically, we're getting around $3.50 a pound. So we're almost tripling the revenue per unit by just changing the way it's grown. So depending on where you're at will dictate if there's an organic market there. But in San Diego, there's a pretty strong organic market here. And so we, and so we definitely try to, to tap into that. And we try to tell the students, you kind of have to tap into that niche market, especially if you're a startup, because there's more enough people growing food. There's a lot of commodity crops out there. But the idea is if you're trying to start a business in farming and trying to survive past year one and two, you have to get into a niche high dollar crop. And so the organic sector is automatically kind of a high dollar crop because it, it demands a higher price. But at the same time, your area might want more local than organic. So it depends on your area will dictate kind of what you bring to the market. Uh, so we obviously teach organic farming here, how to get certified, how that process works. 
Um, irrigation planning and techniques. This is one of the part that the students don't like too often because this is the math part. It's like, if I got a grove of 500 trees of avocados, how do I irrigate them? Like, do I turn on the pump for just five hours and let it go and see what happens or what happens when it rains and so on? And so we do irrigation constraint uh, math on the, how to figure that out. It's like, all right, if I have this soil type, my crop has this demand and the weather is, is X, how do I figure that out? How long do I turn on my sprinklers to give those plants exactly what they need? And that's something we, we get into, at least foundation wise on how to irrigate your crops in, in a sustainable way. And then we talk about compost teas, the brewers, uh, greenhouse design on how, if you were gonna build out a greenhouse, what does that look like? What's the investment? What's my return on investment? Because we let the students know that the average greenhouse, you're paying between 22 and $25 per square foot to build it. And so based off my crop, when do I get that back? And so that's something that, that we get into. And then there's also a plant science side. We, we don't get deep into the plant science because no one here is a plant scientist, but we do talk about how plants react to certain new nutrients, how they react to low light, artificial light, um, how we control the pests, which if anybody who's grown any, anything out there, pests are, all, are always an issue. How do we control that, especially how to control that being organic farm because your list of what you can use for treatments is really, really short. Uh, we get into food safety. Uh, the food safety part of the course is a standalone course within the six or 12 weeks. Uh, and so what happens if you're dealing with any type of food, whether you're gonna sell it or do a demo or make salsa or whatever it is, you have to have some type of food safety certification and we do that here. And we didn't want our students to just have the basic one, we wanna do the, man, the managerial one. And so this allows the students to teach their employees when they do get them. And so that certification is, is nationally recognized and will allow you to uh, do demos or sell your product. And it's good for, I believe, up to five to six years. And uh, we have, I think our pass rate is pretty high for that, for that test. And so we have, we have a really good instructor who deals with food safety every every day, and so that 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 that, uh, that that's part of the course. We go into market analysis. You know what what, what do your buyers want? We talk about farm ownership, uh, what that looks like, because most farms in the U.S. have to be subsidized by some other one of the the uh, somebody on on the farm has to have an outside job, or the farm has to be subsidized. And so we try to teach the model of how not how about how have a farm that's self-sustainable that can pay for its own its own bills um and that that's something we, we try to teach um because we don't want your farm to have to rely on outside resources to to stay open and so we talk about that and how, how to manage the farm how to sell your product schedules on on when when to grow certain things and then we talk about the business plan the business plan is probably uh one of the more intense parts of the course because the whole goal is when you leave the six weeks and 12 week courses, you have a business plan you can use to seek uh, funding uh, through, through the USDA or through a bank. And so it's a completed plan. And that talks about your financial statements, your profit and loss statement, your cash flow. And um, the idea is that when you leave, you have a plan that can be used to start your farm. Um, by having that part of the course in which we use a software called Live, uh, Live Plan, L-I-V-E, is that the USDA has allowed us to be certified as a, um, I don't know what they actually called it, a uh, financials borrower's instructor in a sense. And so we, um, if you called the USDA now and you wanted to get a loan, they're going to tell you we need to go through some type of financial course. So we know how you, so you know how loans work, how to pay them back, how to run your operations side and so on. Well, we do that in the course already. So they deem this course as certified to apply for their loans. The, in which their lending arm is the FSA, which is the Farm Service Agency. So that's the USDA's bank. And so they see us as trainers for that side, but they also saw what we did here with the greenhouses and, and the intense growing. And they also certify that the six week course and the 12 week course are a year's worth of experience which will allow you to apply for their starting loans because all their loans require at least a year's worth of experience to even apply. You get that one year here. And so there are loans that they have that require more. I believe their farm owner ownership loan requires three years. So you get one year here. And then I believe if you were in the military and were an E5 or above, you can get another year there. And so you're on your way to getting the, the, the three years. But the, the point being is that um, a lot of our students that have graduated 
have used the, the, the USDA loans. And that's mainly because they will give you a loan with a business that has not operated yet, which most banks will not because you need prior financial statements to get that loan. And they also, um, with that one year experience, they're also great loans because the interest rates are, are subsidized. The interest rates now are kind of high. They're probably around three to 4%, but you compare that to the SBA's loans for a, a business and they're around 11 to 13% right, right, uh, right now. I've seen the, uh, the FSA's loans probably around 1%, which is free money really. Um, but we've had our students, our graduates probably borrow altogether probably close to $3 million. Uh, most of those loans are smaller loans because the micro loan, which is up to 50K is probably one of the more popular loans because it's ease of entry is, is, is well suited for our students. And then we also have had students take out loans. I think the highest loan a student's taken out or a graduate is 287K. We don't recommend that high of a loan because that's a lot of risk to take in the beginning, but it's something you can apply for those loans once you get out of here. And so we definitely um, definitely want our students to take advantage of those those loans if 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 they want to. And so, yeah, so that that's the business plan side. And then um, with the business plan side too, uh, just a few stats. We've had about 550 students graduate. We probably have had uh, over 150 farms start and then another probably 80 plus businesses start just in general. A lot of our students uh, realize that they don't want to maybe start a farm, but they want to own a business within the ag world. And so they'll start a service-based industry making compost tea for farmers, uh, helping farmers control pest control. We've had students start restaurants. We've had students start uh, coffee shops, uh, smog, shop, uh, smog shops for vehicles, uh, we had one that was taking um, land that couldn't be used because certain things were dumped on it and converting it to grow sites with greenhouses. Um, we've had a lot of businesses started that don't necessarily deal with only a farm. So we kind of we kind of cover the full gambit when it comes to the ag world. And our students, we let them know that, you know, you don't have to start to just start a farm to kind of make the best of the program. Ideally, the students who come through want to be entrepreneurs and they happen to want to do it in the ag world. And so it's something that all the information you learn, especially the business side, will translate over to any business because you have to understand your, your P&L statements, your cash flow, how to uh, depreciate your assets, how to amortize your loan and so on. And so it's something that the stuff you learn here will apply to any business you would ever, ever, ever start. So, But we also obviously get into the plant science side and get into all that. But we definitely point out that you can grow the product, but if you can't sell it, then it really isn't much help. And so how do we grow the product based off what the market wants and how do we pay our employees? And so that's kind of a, a big piece of the course is the business side of that. All right, so let's see what we got here next. Um, this is just a graduating class. Um, this was back when I had actual brown hair. And so um, it's obviously gray now, but it's something that we usually run a cohort between probably currently between probably eight and 15 students. We don't like to get anything over 18 students because it tends to dilute down the quality that you guys have. And so we have run a cohort at 26, but we just feel like that that's too much. And then so sometimes we have co cohorts as small as, as five or six. And, um, and so, yeah, so it's kind of a mix, but we try to keep the classes small. And obviously, if you guys probably know, that's Colin on the right-hand side and then Karen on the top in the middle there. So... All right, and this is just a few of the alumni. This is their labels that we kind of threw up here. Um, it's something that it's one of those things that even if the student doesn't want to own a farm or a business, if they're just trying to find a job in the ag sector, it's something we definitely try to help with that. And then we have had students who just want to go back to school. They want to take the credits they've earned here, and then they want to go back to school to kind of continue their education in plant science or botany or whatever it is. Um, almost all the credits that you guys would earn here will transfer over, assuming it's going towards some type of ag degree. Um, if you're looking at getting a degree in liberal studies, uh, most of the material won't transfer over. And so it's not something that depends on what you're going for there. So yeah, this is a few of them there. And then um, for, this, uh, for this year, we have a few more cohorts left. Uh, for the day class, we have one in June and then August and October. Uh, those are the six week model. And so it's something that it's a, about a month and a half. And then we do have another nights that is starting um, September 18. And that runs 12 weeks. And the night class too, obviously uh, works a lot better for, uh, for students that are, are working full, full time or just want kind of a, 
slower pace for the material um, because all, all we did is the six week course, the material that we teach in one week, we just spread it over two weeks for the 12 week course. And so, so yeah. And then um, let's see what we got next here. I think we're gonna have some contact information here. Um, this is a contact and you guys can write this down if you haven't seen it on the website. Uh, Laura is kind of our enrollment coordinator. So if you guys have questions about enrollments, um, what is what type of grants might be available or GI Bill or so on, um, it's something that um, she kind of handles getting you guys into class, any questions you might have. And I usually take over from, from day one. And then also once you guys graduate, we try to uh, keep that relationship going because we don't want to lose contact with you guys. We want to be a resource for you for when you um, for when you graduate and leave, because um, at least here, um, a lot of our students are going back to a different state to uh, farm and we want to be a resource there. So Laura and I uh, are accessible to our students once you graduate. And so we've had students, excuse me, or alumni reach back after you know, two years saying, hey, can I come and sit through that compost tea class again? Because um, I kind of forgot what the material was. We have no problem with students coming back and, and taking the whole course again if they want. If you come back for that second round, we don't register you as a full-time student, so you don't have to pay again, uh, but, that, but that material is there. And then all the material that we have during the course, we kind of push that into a Dropbox account, which you guys have access to indefinitely. And so you can go back there and grab what you want. Uh, you know, at, at whatever time uh, you, you want there. And then with the graduates too, we also um, have the option for, we have an alumni uh, Facebook group for the graduates. Um, it's one of those things, even if you're anti-Facebook, if you're gonna, if you're gonna own a business, you're kind of stuck with it. And so, but with this closed group, uh, only alumni are in there. And then um, you guys can ask questions to other alumni, they'll share their experiences with the loans, advice on pest control in the Southeast or whatever it is. Uh, but it's something that group is kind of self-perpetuating that students kind of, we used to have to fill stuff in, but now the students or the graduates kind of do it on their own. And so it's something that's the fastest way to, to reach out to other students who, who have graduated. And so, so yeah, so I think that's probably it for about the farm side and the, um, and the school side. So let me see. And then a few questions, Tony, just yep. from the Q and A. Yep. So, Department is available all over, right? All over the U.S. What's available? The program, the online courses. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, we've had students in different countries too. It's just you got to figure out the uh, time, the time zone thing. Okay, and then they're fully online, correct? Correct. Yep, and and on that on that note, we do show you guys how to build a hydroponic system where you're at if you can't make it out here. And can you tell me a bit about the time commitment? Like, for example, on these night classes, how do they work? What time are they? How long do they last? Yep. We, we usually tell the students it's about eight to 10 hours a week of academic work if you do the six-week course. And then if you're in a 12-week course, that obviously goes down to four to five hours a week. And so a lot of reading material, because you're basically doing a three-unit college course every week or every two weeks. And so it's something that is definitely, you know, uh, kind of a culture shock if you haven't been in school for a while. But we definitely give students extensions if they need it on, on work, as long as we can get the work done before you graduate. Um, but I would say probably the normal six week class is probably eight to 10 hours a week. And uh, are these like any specific time or just like on yep. their, they're at their own pace? Well, we meet on Mondays and Thursdays at 09 till about 1 p.m. Um, and then if for some reason you can't make it, we, we record all the classes. And so what happens is I'll record that class and I send the link out the, the uh, next day. We obviously want you to come to class, but it's there if you have appointments, life happens and, and so, so on. And then for example, um, if someone wants to take t the six weeks to take off and go there and take the classes in person, mm -hmm. would that be better than taking it online or does it just depend on the person? Yeah, and the thing about it, the farm itself doesn't have any full-time employees because it's still a small farm. And so it's something that if you came out here to take the course, you would you would do the lectures online, but we would probably we could probably allocate maybe 20 hours of work a week. Um, at least that's probably what we'd have here. You obviously would have to get hired on as a, as a as a, as a part time employee, but that's probably the best use of the time if you're actually going to come out here. And that's something you would line up before you obviously came out here, because if you just come out here, 
and just want to come visit the farm, that's fine, of course. But when it comes to working on the farm, uh, we obviously want to know who who's going to be here. Okay. And um, are these lectures recorded or they're live? Uh, we do them live, but we record them for if you can't make it. Fair enough. Okay. Yep. And do you know the total cost? Like, how does the veteran apply for this yep. program? And so the, the program cost? itself um, is based off the university, and the full course is six six thousand eighty one dollars, and that's based off the credits. And we do have some grants available and some scholarships. And so it's something depending on what's available at that time. Laura is kind of the point of contact for that. Uh, but it's something that the, the university bases that off the tuition rate. Okay. And then when you're talking about the farm, can you supplement these um, plants with LED grow lights? You can, but for us, we found it to be pretty expensive uh, for LED lights. Uh, behind me over my, what's that, my left ear? That's high pressure so, uh, sodium lights. So those are about 400 bucks a unit with the LEDs for the same kind of spacing. We're close to a grand. And so we, they just didn't have the capital for that. Uh, LED lights are the, are the best to use. But if you're doing, say, a, an, you know, 50,000 square feet of greenhouse, that could be pretty expensive. And obviously, too, the power needs for that. Um, you, I, I, you have to figure that out. But it's something that it can work. But for us, um, the cash flow just wouldn't allow for it. Okay. And have people use VRNE for your program? V and is that, uh, I think that's originally Voc Rehab. I think that's the original name, but yes, they have. It's usually determined by their counselor. Their counselor will approve it or not. Um, we've had it approved for Voc Rehab or VRNE, um, and we've had it you know, did, uh, did denied. And so it really is depending on, 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 on the counselor. Okay. Yep. All right. You can continue on. Okay. Um, I like to try to see if I can give you guys a short farm tour without holding up a laptop like I'm 70. Um, so give me a second and let me see if I can get this camera to work on this phone. And then we could do that. Um, let's see here. Give me one second. If not, what I'll do is I'll kind of just bring the laptop to one little area and show you guys kind of what's what's going on here. Um let me see here one second. Is there any questions, Diego, while I'm trying to figure this out so we can knock out two birds with one, one, with one stone? Yeah, another one is coming up is where did the days and times for the 12B course? It's Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. on the West Coast time. And it, it goes until about 9. Okay. So. All right, we might have to go old school here. Hey, Diego, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to leave the meeting and come back in on my phone. Okay, that's fine. Okay, all right. So just give me one second here, and I'll go ahead and stop and share at the same time. So let's go ahead and leave. All right, he'll be right back, everyone. Um, keep asking questions if you like, and Laura, if you're here, if you can just help answer these questions in the chat, that would be greatly appreciated. Yes, it is say Tuesday night, 6 to 9 p.m. West Coast time. Yes, there it is. So in the, you can look in the chat, that's when the times are. Make sure you can join back. And how do you apply? You can head to, um, let me put their link in the chat. That way you can have that for you. There's already a course going on right now, but the next course is available in June. So here's the link to the website. You can apply through the website or, hit, or reach out to Laura via email. That's how you would 
apply or just find more information. Yes, there it is right there. And let's see. All right, Diego. So I didn't have any luck. So <laughs> like we'll just run, we'll run through the greenhouse, but behind me here so you guys can kind of see it. Um, what we have going on back here, and I'll kind of step to the side. Um, this is the greenhouse that uh, runs uh, 35 by 110. And so what we have behind us is Persian cucumbers, which is basically a cucumber that's pulled early. Uh, so it comes in a pack of six. We put it in a plastic clamshell and we put a sticker on top there. What you guys see at the bottom are the NFT channels. And so the water will flow from the high side down to the low, low side into a manifold. And it'll go into a main pipe that kind of runs down this alleyway here under on underground out to the tank in which I'll show you. I think it's pumped back up. And so the poly on top is 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 two ply on top. And then you guys can see the lighting in the fans. And then you can't really see it, but all the way in the back, there's this cardboard kind of wall, which we call a call. It's called a cool wall or it's like a swamp cooler. And so when it gets too hot in here, the uh, the walls will go down. Water will run down the backside of that cool wall and the fans will pull air through it. So we can cool down the house probably 10 to 15 degrees if it gets too hot here. So for us, it's more the heat that, that we deal with here in the Southwest. Um, if you're somewhere else, it might be more of, of the cold. And so we do have a pro, uh, pro propane heater here in the house. Um, it's elevated, it's behind me. Uh, the best way to heat a greenhouse is through um, a radiant floor heating. That's the best way to do it because obviously the heat will 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 rise up from the bottom. For us, with the with the with the heater being on the ceiling, we have to heat the top of the greenhouse first before we can heat heat the bottom. Um, and so, and then the lighting behind me that's HPS or high pressure sodium. Those are mainly for crops that are in the flowering or the bloom stage. And for us, it's something that in San Diego. The days are so bright and kind of so long. We haven't used those lights in probably about six years. So there's actually no, no actual bulb in it. Uh, well, one of the things you want to do uh, with a greenhouse like this is you want to make sure that you have enough power that, to run the greenhouse. Because if all these lights are on the same time, it probably pulls about 200 amps. And so you got to make sure your power source can supply that or you would just run the lights in certain zones. And so we haven't had to do it in a while. And all, when we would do it, we, we would just extend the days. So when the days are short, instead of being 14 hours long, they were going down to you know maybe 10 hours of light. We'd supplement those other, other four hours, kind of extending the day, and the lights would kick off. You can keep the lights on all night if you wanted to, but the plants do need to have some type of rest time. And then it's not really worth it to pay for that power when you you know when you don't need, need it and so it's something that we kind of just keep, uh, keep them off now there are tra tra uh, trellising lines you guys can see that kind of hold that vine off the floor because we don't want the product on the actual floor because it will start to rot and then also food safety we can't really have any product that's going to be sold actually touching the the uh, the uh, ground there um with this greenhouse here which is about a little over four thousand, i'd say plus square feet we can, if we did basil in here, we could do about 4,000 plant sites. And, and it's something that with the fruiting crop like this, uh, we probably get close to, I'd say maybe 2,000 at, at the most. We, um, so point being is that with the system like this, you can change the crops. It doesn't need to be one crop for the whole season. We can pull stuff out really fast and then put in a new seedling there. And so it's something that with the hydroponic system in a, in a greenhouse, our turnover for changing crops is just really fast. And so we'll leave these binding crops in here for probably uh, six to eight months, and then we'll, we'll pull them. And then if they get too high where they're about to touch the lights, we actually can lower the plant down and the bottom vine will actually start to coil. And then you just have the full foliage and the, and the actual um, fruit itself on that last six feet. And so we've done it with uh, tomato plants before where the vine itself is probably close to 30 to 40 feet long. We just coil up the bottom part that doesn't have any fruit on it anymore. And so we just kind of just keep it growing to a certain point. After the vine probably gets between, I say 30 and 40 feet long, the plant has a problem pushing the water up. And so we usually pull them at that time and then we'll just start a new run of crops. Um, and so with this system itself, you can do most crops. Um, 
The only ones you really can't do are larger crops, maybe like an egg, egg, uh, eggplant or any type of, of crop that has a large fruit on it. Uh, tomatoes work fine here, but you have to prune a lot because you can't let it become a bush. It has to be one, one main vine. And then I know in here, um, we also were doing hemp for a while because hemp was approved by, by the USDA in 2018 or 19. Um, and hemp is a sister plant of cannabis, but there's no THC at all. And so it's something it's used for CBD oil and other, other uh, textiles and crops. And so we were doing hemp here for a, 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 for a little while for clones, uh, but the regulations got too much, uh, too much work for us to manage, especially in this state on what you can and can't do, who has to inspect the crops. And, and we got out of it because it's just, it wasn't worth the, the headache, um, at least in this state to, uh, to deal with hemp, but that is an approved uh, crop. And some people will do it for textiles. Some will do it for clones. Some will do it for biomass. Some will do it for oil. And so there is there is a market for it, but it's it's kind of crazy right now because it's still kind of it's it's a newborn in a way. And so a lot of big money going into it, and and sometimes there's not a lot of quality there. And so we tried it for a little bit and kind of got out of that game and and, and sticking to specialty pro produce. Um, and this greenhouse, I do get a, a question a lot about. Well, can we do, you know, avocado trees or citrus or so on? Um, those crops don't work too well here because uh, you're not getting enough return revenue wise to pay for the structure because you need crops in here that uh, demand a high dollar point, but also their turnover is fast. Um, if we did avocado trees in here, we could probably fit, I don't know, maybe 30 of them. And it wouldn't even pay for a quarter of the greenhouse because you're just not selling enough fruit and from such a big plant in such a small space. And so this greenhouse alone, um, Cost wise, this was built back in 2010, I think. Uh, back in 2010, this greenhouse was around 150K, and that's with the contractor. So, if you have a good group of friends and maybe a, a forklift, you, you can build it on your own. But one of the toughest things with most structures is keeping them square. And so, it's something that with, if you did it without the contractor, you could probably do it for under 100K. But even now with inflation, um, the structure alone, you're probably going to be paying close to, to 200K for it. And then finding a contractor that uh, knows how to build these is also hard too. And so it's something that um, they're kind of hard to get constructed cost-wise, but once they're up, you're going to get probably, I don't know, probably 50 to 60 years out of the structure itself because it's, it's all galvanized pipe. And then the plastic itself, we just redid the plastic on this greenhouse on the top. Um, that was about two years ago. And the original plastic lasted a good 15 years. And so, and the plastic here is especially plastic for a greenhouse. It's not the stuff you buy at a Home Depot, uh, but it's something that the structure itself is pretty sound. I know for us, the footers themselves, we had to dig at least uh, six feet down. And so it does have a wind load and it does have a, 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 a snow load. And so we don't see the structure going anywhere for a while. And if you can see it, we do have gravel on, on the floor here. I know if uh, Con and Karen were going to do the build out again, they would not do gravel. It's kind of hard to walk on for an employee to walk on it all day. Um, they would do concrete, but just in the walkways. And so it's something that um, concreting the whole pad here is kind of a waste of money. You just want the main areas, uh, but it's something that gravel is tough to work on. And some people will do weed cloth and put that down as an, as an, as an inexpensive way to do it. But concrete is definitely the uh, for first choice on that. So, and then what I'll do too, I'll see if I can turn this around so you guys can see the seedlings. Let's see yeah, so a works. quick question. Can you do um, any vining crops like passion fruit or pineapples? You can. Um, I've never really seen pineapples done in hydroponics because they're usually done in soil. Um, and then you got to figure out how much you can get for the pineapple because we try not to get into any of the commodity crops. So your major crops like cotton, soybean, wheat, and so on, because Price-wise, as a new farmer, you just can't really compete unless you have thousands of acres. And so pineapples, I would say, are not really a specialty product. Um, basil would be specialty product, maybe dragon fruit, um, stuff like that. Um, that's probably what I'd fo focus on. Pineapple could probably be done, but you wouldn't make any money after paying for the structure itself. So, sure. Yep. And then what I'll do, I'll turn this here so you guys can try to see the seedlings. And so we do our seedlings. These are trays of 128. And so we do it in a, uh, 
these are going to be probably tomatoes or cucumbers. Um, the seedling media itself, I don't know if you can see it. That's a combination for us. We use vermiculite, uh, peat moss, and some worm castings. And then these tables are flood and drain tables. So they will flood and drain twice a day to kind of keep it saturated. And the seedlings will be in here for probably, I don't know, maybe two to three weeks. And once they get their first set of true leaves, we'll pull them out and then we'll put it into the NFT channels. And then we have this sheeting here because if you've ever farmed, there's definitely room and they like to eat the sea seedlings and the seeds specifically and so and then i'll show you guys some that are ready to almost plant you guys can see over there i don't know if it's your right or left but those are about ready to go into the uh the plant sites and then there's cucumbers on the far table we have some lacinato kale on the left here and then some tomatoes or more cucumbers on the uh, right there and so uh, so so yeah so that is the seedlings and then we were buying the seedlings for a while, but we uh, we realized that it was more cost effective for us to do the seedlings in in house here. So, all right. Well, I guess let's move on to some questions. I think uh, we're running a little short on time there. Yeah. Um, how competitive is enrollment, or they're usually open opening seeds cohort? It's usually pretty open. We we definitely do an initial in interview that makes sure this is a good fit for you because we don't want you to waste your time for six weeks if taking on the, ac the academic load is too much for you to do. Uh, but it's something that most of the time, if you're able to take a college course, um, it's usually fine. And it's something that even if you're not, but you're pretty savvy um, just with the academic side, um, it shouldn't be a problem. But we haven't, we only had probably maybe about maybe 10 to 20 students a year that we just feel like it's not a good fit for. And but most students, if they feel like they want to take on what's going on here, then it definitely works out in the end. And then for the six week course, so how often, like, how many days are in like the classroom? How many days are in the farm? How does that work? Well, if you're local, you can come out to the farm whenever you want. We actually have student labs that are available for the students to take over, which they're basically a small shade house. Um, they just need they need to manage it at least to come by once a week. And so it's something that if you're local, you can actually, you know, come on the farm, do work, do a farm tour, have a student lab, or you can not and just get it all online. It's really up to you. If you're not local, then obviously you're kind of stuck a little bit, um, but it's something that the farm has an open door when it comes to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, students. Okay. Um, let's see if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to ask them. And then, and then as a, a side note, we have had students who use their GI Bill. We've had students use their TA. Um, we've had Voc Rehab a few times. Um, and then, yeah, then that's probably most of the VA funding itself. Most of the students use Chapter 33 uh, for the VA. And then we have had students who just pay, to just pay cash to. So. Do you teach how to make nutrients? Oh yeah, we talk about the compost tea. Uh, we did compost teas here for a long time, and then we actually switched to a fermented colloidal molasses is what we use now. Okay. Um, let's see. Tony, are you able to look at the Q and A? Hey, what's up? Are you able to look at the Q and A? Yeah, I can kind of pull it up here. I might be able to breeze through this. Let's see what we got. We just got five left in there. Okay. I see the nutrients part. Is there one I'm missing above it or? The Q and A left chat. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Wrong, wrong box. Should be, should be right next to participants. If not, it's fine. Uh, I don't have any questions on my screen, so I don't know if it doesn't let me see those. It says no open questions. Okay, no problem. Um, let's see, I think that was it then. Are the grow lights Gavitas, Gavitas? Uh, I'm, I don't know if that's a brand or not. The high pressure sodium is the actual bulb itself. Okay. H HPPS. Okay. Uh, well, if we don't have any more questions, I'll just go real quick before we end over FEC. Uh, for those of you that don't know Farmer Veteran Coalition, um, what we do, we help um, veterans who just got out um, find careers in agriculture, whether they're beginning or they already know a bunch of agriculture, doesn't matter. We help them find careers. We get them, we help them network with other people. 
we help them find um, resources, whether it's funding with the USDA, all that kind of stuff. Um, we have two programs. We had the Homegrown My Heroes program, which lets people, um, that's veterans, sell their products through the Homegrown My Heroes label. It's a separate, separate competition. Just your own unique label just shows that this is grown by a veteran. And then we had the fellowship fund. We had it every year, uh, usually from January up till February, I, think, I believe, is when it opens. So it just closed this year, but we give grants and we're ranging from $1,000 to $5,000, as well as we have a partnership with Kubota gear to give where we uh, where Kubota gives five tractors to people around the nation. So um, follow us on Facebook. Um, keep Just keep up, stay updated with us. We have podcasts um, going out. So be sure to check that out on check your Facebook. Um, if you're not a member, please become a member. And um, thank you everybody for attending this uh, webinar. Hope it was helpful for everyone. Tony, any last words? I just want to say thanks for giving me the opportunity to share what we do. Uh, the FEC has always been a great supporter of our program. So it's been awesome.